Watch, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or at cock crow, or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Lord, open our lips. And our mouths shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Alleluia. Our King and Savior now draws near. Come. Be joyful in the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with a song. Know this, the Lord himself is God. He himself has made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and call upon his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his faithfulness endures from age to age. Surely it is God who saves me. I will trust in him and will not be afraid. For the Lord is my stronghold and my sure defense. Therefore, you shall draw water with rejoicing. From the springs of salvation. And on that day you shall say, Give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Make his deeds known among the peoples. See that I remember that his name is exalted. Sing the praises of the Lord, for he has done great things. Cry aloud, inhabitants of Zion. Ring out your joy. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. A reading from the book of the prophet Zephaniah. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has turned away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall fear disaster no more. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands grow weak. The Lord, your God, is in your midst, a warrior who gives victory. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will renew you in his love. 
he will exult over you with loud singing as on the day, a day of festival. I will remove disaster from you so that you will not bear reproach for it. I will deal with all your oppressors at that time. And I will save the lame and gather the outcast. And I will cha uh, change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time, I will bring you home at the time when I gather you. For I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth. When I restore your for fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. The word of the Lord. Our eyes shine, for your light has come, and, and the glory of the Lord has gone upon you. For behold, darkness covers the A reading from the letter of Paul to the Philippians. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks. Cast down 
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham for, as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the ax is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then should we do? In reply, he said to them, Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? He said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what should we do? He said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusations, and be satisfied with your wages. As the people were filled with expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary but the shaft he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If you exist anywhere in our society, anywhere near the internet, you will no doubt have seen at least one list of the most iconic Christmas movies of all time. And one that I think gets left off of most of them, which surprises me, which may say more about my age than anything, is Home Alone, uh, which is most definitely a Christmas movie, uh, and has within it a scene where the young protagonist uh, is watching uh, a Christmas gangster movie from about the 40s, uh, and is taken with a scene in which one of the gangsters, after emptying his machine gun against his enemies, says, Merry Christmas, you filthy animals. And, that, and uses that line later in the film during his defense of his home from home invasion. And so I think that that young protagonist in Home Alone would have really liked John and John's proclamation in this morning's gospel. Because Merry Christmas, you filthy animals, sounds a lot like you brood of vipers who told you to flee from the wrath to come. But I think if we go that direction, if we think that way about John's proclamation and put it on the same level as Merry Christmas, You Filthy Animals, we do John a little bit of a disservice. And the first hint of that, though it's hard for me to admit it because, as some of you know, I am not a fan of snakes. 
uh, is that the Gospel of Luke declares that everything that John says to the people is good news. And it's at first hard to square that idea with calling someone a brood of vipers. What John is doing, actually, though, to give John a little bit of credit, is that John is identifying the fact that the people who are coming out for him to be baptized are making a choice. They have already made a choice the same way that snakes do when they start to slither away from a wildfire, which is something that they would have been that they would have understood, that John would have understood coming from the wilderness around Galilee, where fires and snakes are both common events. Snakes know that that's too much heat for them, being cold-blooded animals, and they run away. And John compares the people of Judea coming out to the edge of the wilderness, to the River Jordan, to be baptized by John in that same way. You see, what John is doing in baptizing people in the River Jordan is in some parts of first century Judaism the same thing that you would do if you were a Gentile seeking to become a follower of Judaism, fully pulled into Judaism as a faith. You would be baptized in the River Jordan in the same way that the children of Israel were baptized in their passing through the River Jordan, going from the wilderness to the promised land in the book in the, in the um, book of Joshua. So this is a ritual that has some import in the first century, even before John starts doing it. But for John to be doing it to people who have been Jewish their entire lives, says is, is making a declarative statement about where John thinks people are in their life in regards to their faith, that it requires a refounding. And to, to really hit home that they must refound not just their outward ritual, John gets their attention calling them snakes fleeing a wildfire. And it's not enough, John says, for you to have fleed the wildfire to the river. You must change your shape as well. You must no longer be vipers. You must be something else. Because God can make children of Abraham from stones. And so God must make children of Abraham in truth and life and deed out of you vipers. John calls the people who come out to him to radical repentance and reformation of life and deeds. And he says, the consequence of not doing so, of simply saying, well, I did the outward and visible sign without accepting the inward and spiritual change of life and therefore of deeds and fruits of that outward and visible sign and of change. If you don't make that change in your life and the way you live it, you will be like the fig tree that produces no figs and is therefore cut down and thrown in the fire. And of course, the people wanting to make sure that they know what the score really is say, well, what then are we supposed to do? What's the answer, huh, John? Give, us, give it to us cut and dry. As if it hadn't already been given to the Jewish people, the people of Israel, cut and dry time and time and time again in the books of the prophets. Micah 6, 8 being just one example love justice, do mercy, and walk humbly with your God. What must we do? John lays it out very plainly. If you have two coats, give one to someone who has none. If you have more food than you need for the day, share it with someone who has none. The shock that the gospel expresses at tax collectors coming out to John is because that particularly within uh, the large opinion polls of the, of the first century, if you had one of uh, a Marist poll of who's the worst profession in first century Palestine, it would have said tax collectors. 
Because they, they were given the job of raising X amount of money to give to the government, to Herod, to Rome, to the city, to the temple, whatever, for the use of this road, this market, this property. And then they could go to these people and say, and, and say, I need X, even though what they actually needed to fulfill the tax was X minus 25%. Because that 25%, then they, they then got to keep. So the, the business of tax collection was very lucrative for the people doing it and very ruinous for everybody else. And, and so when Luke says even tax collectors were coming to John, what he means is even the people who are doing some of the worst things that you can imagine to their fellow person realize that it's wrong and come to John and say, what must I do? And John says, only raise what you're supposed to. Stop gouging people. And soldiers come to John. What must we do? And John's like, what do you think? Remember, these soldiers are probably Herod's soldiers, and they act as a de facto police force in certain parts of Palestine, Judea, and Galilee, especially. And so John looks at them and says, don't extort people. Don't make people's lives worse, harder. Don't make false accusations. And what John is talking about is the propensity of soldiers in first, the first century to basically set up protection rackets to augment their pay. When John, when John tells them, be content with your wages, what John, John doesn't mean, oh, just let you know, your boss charge you, uh, pay you whatever he thinks is fair. Right? That, that idea of fair wages and capitalism and all that was not the same then it is now. And we can't force our idea of that onto it, although fair wages are incredibly important. What John is saying is that you can't set up a protection rack. You can't walk into the, the local businesses and say, it's a really nice shop you got here. It'd be a shame if something were to happen to it. It'd be a shame if we heard that you were talking bad about the king. But for a, a weekly sum of one denarius, we'll make sure that no one says, no one thinks you said anything bad about the king. John tells the soldiers, don't do that. Treat people with dignity. And if you have extra, give it. Do justice, love mercy. Walk humbly with your God. It is as simple as you think it is, John seems to say. Not easy, but simple. Because John looks at these people who are coming out to him to be baptized, and he sees potential. Just look at what he says about the Messiah when he's making it clear that he's not the Messiah. He says, one who is coming after me will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire like someone who goes and winnows wheat. Now, I might have been a city kid, but I did grow up in Montana. I do know how wheat works for the most part. The wheat and the chaff are both part of the same single stock. Right? This isn't like separating good people from bad people when John is making this example. It's not... The good people are the wheat, and the bad people are the chaff, and they're all going to burn. That's not how wheat works. right? In, in wheat, you have the stalk, you have the outer protective layers around the berry of the wheat, and then you have the berry itself. And so when you thresh wheat, you get rid of the bits of stalk and the outer husks that keep wheat from being able to be digested by humans, and you keep the berry that which gives life, that which is life-giving, which can be transformed into flour and bread and everything else that we can do. 
But it's all the one thing. It's not that we're separating people from people. It's that we're separating the parts of people that are not life-giving from the parts of any one person that is life-giving. It's kind of like the moon. My son has, my child has been a little obsessed with the moon. Um, they're, they're fascinated by it, particularly when it rises before the sun sets and they can still see it. And we've been talking a lot about how the moon actually doesn't give off its own light. The moon has no light of its own. It is simply reflecting the sun's light. And when I, I knew that they understood this concept when they started talking about it like a mirror. They said, the moon is like the mirror in my room. When I turn my, the light by my bed on, it reflects in the mirror. But if I'm standing in one spot, it only reflects in part of the mirror. And if I'm standing in another spot, it doesn't reflect in the mirror at all. And if I'm not near my mirror, it reflects on the whole mirror. I said, yeah, that's, that's how the moon works. It reflects the light that can get to it, where something is not in the way. One of the blessings of the way we've done our liturgy this Advent is that we've been using morning prayer as for the first part of our liturgy. And we get to sing more of the old hymns that we call canticles. And one of the ones we've used the whole, this, this whole season has been what we call the third song of Isaiah that starts, Arise, shine, for your light has come. Isaiah calls the people in that song to arise and shine, to stand free of obstruction and reflect the light that has come to them. Because they can't shine on their own, right? People don't shine, but they can reflect light. They can reflect God's love. And in this season, which, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, is a season in which there is not very much light to be had when the sun goes down at like three in the afternoon. The idea of reflecting light, of giving off light while it's around, is very important. John calls the people in this morning's gospel to repentance because life in God is about more than repentance, but it's not about less. Now, some people balk at the idea of a penitential advent, uh, of an advent that is focused on repentance. An advent is certainly about more than repentance, but it's not about less than that. Because repentance is about turning back toward light, about turning back toward God and God's love. And it's only if we're turned toward it that we can reflect it, right? The whole thing with my child about talking about the moon comes from this concept that they could not grasp at first about the dark side of the moon, the side of the moon that the sun does not reflect on, that we never see the sun reflected in because it's the side that's always turned away from the sun. It's only the side that turns toward the sun that can reflect its rays to us. It is only if we are turned toward God that we can reflect God's love and light to the world. And it is only if we are honest about the things that stand in the way of that. All those changes and chances of life that obscure God's love from us and us from reflecting it out into the world, whether they are parts of our work life or home life or financial life or whatever. Anything that causes us to be unable to reflect God's love in the world, repentance is the chance for us to remove them, waxing ever greater and greater in the brightness of the reflected love of God. That is what John is calling the people who come out to see him at the River Jordan to. To reflect God's love and light. To reflect the Holy Spirit and fire with which the Messiah will baptize them. With which he has baptized us. 
Our work is to reflect that light, that love, as much as we are able in this life and in the kingdom that is coming into the world that we celebrate in Advent, the kingdom of God's love, where that light will be perfected, so much that we will not need the sun or moon to see, because God's light will be among us, reflected in us fully, as we have been refined to that only which is life-giving, only which is of God. When we have been turned from rocks and serpents into children of Abraham, children of God, beloved and bright. Amen. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all of that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, almighty God, that all who confess your name may be unified, united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. We pray for Justin, the Archbishop of Canterbury, for the Anglican Church of Canada, for Michael, the presiding bishop, for the Old Catholic Church of the Union of Utrecht and the Diocese of Central Ecuador, Colombia, and the Dominican Republic. We pray for Greg, our bishop, Brian and Melissa Bishops Assisting, for the Annie Wright School in Tacoma, the Charles Wright Academy in Tacoma, and the Table University of Washington Episcopal Campus Ministry. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all those whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. We pray especially for Judy, Kathy, Kathy, Ginny, Scott, Sue, Sharon, Tom, Jean, Daryl, Lizzie and Lucy, and Phil. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. We pray especially for Joanne and Tom. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Stir up your power, O Lord, and with great might come among us. And because we are sorely hindered by our sins, let your bountiful grace and mercy speedily help and deliver us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Now, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, because you sent your beloved son to redeem us from sin and death and to make us heirs in him of everlasting life. That when he shall come again in power and great triumph to judge the world, we may without shame or fear rejoice to behold his appearing. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your words spoken through the prophets, and above all, in Jesus Christ, the word made flesh. But in these last days, you sent Jesus to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In Christ, you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In Christ, you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Savior Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember Christ's death. We proclaim Christ's resurrection. We await Christ's coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Savior of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray, you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, through whom we are acceptable to you, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where with all your saints we may enter the everlasting heritage of your children. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By Christ, and with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Shall 
the gifts of God for the people of God. body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven.
Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of Christ and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Savior. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit be honor and glory now and forever. Amen. God's blessing be with you. Christ's peace be with you. The Spirit's outpouring be with you and remain with you now and forevermore. Amen. Please be seated for a moment. Welcome to all. We're glad you're here with us this morning, whether you're here in person or on our video stream. We're glad you've joined us. A few brief announcements. The first one is that in the bulletin or on our website, you will find uh, the schedule for our Christmas services. Christmas Eve, we have services at 4 p.m. and 8 p.m. The 8 p.m. will be streamed. Christmas Day, we have one service at 10 a.m. And then the day after Christmas, which is a Sunday, we have one service at 10 a.m. I don't feel like I have to emphasize this as much at the 10 o'clock as I did at the 8, but there's one service on Sunday the 26th at 10 a.m. That will also be streamed. Uh, because we have somewhat limited seating in this building, if you want to, or plan to attend the um, Christmas services in person, there's a sign-up sheet in the back. Please go and fill that out, one line per family to let us know which one you're coming to so we can try to evenly, as much as we can, distribute uh, the people participating in person throughout the services. If you are online and you would like to attend one of the Christmas services in person, you can email me, rector at redeemer kemororg and I can make sure that your name gets on that list. Uh, one of the things we've done for many, many years here at the church is provide meals for the people staying at Homely Kenmore Place during Christmas. Um, this year, they've asked us to do something a little bit different than we have before. We're not collecting food items uh, for their Christmas meal. Uh, we are collecting donations so that we can provide them with a uh, gift card so that they can buy their own Christmas meal that fits where they're at in their family, in their culture, uh, and matches uh, what they need this Christmas. Uh, you can make donations by uh, going to our website. There's more instructions in your bulletin about how to do that. Um, the same thing is true of gifts. This year, the gifts are being done a little bit differently by HopeLink. Uh, and so you can go online to our website and find uh, and, and subscribe to bring a gift unwrapped to church next Sunday. The collection time for the, the presents that you sign up for to bring our next Sunday. Uh, a reminder that when you go to the website, you sign up to bring one, you subscribe. Then you actually have to bring the gift to the church next Sunday. Um, so I hope that you will join us in making sure that there are gifts for all the children at Hopelink Camera Place and throughout the Hopelink Network this Christmas. There are lots of other announcements in your bulletin and on our website. I hope that you will read Mark, learn, and inwardly digest them very soon and that we will see you again in whatever form you choose to join us. Now, one more hymn before we finish our liturgy and begin our service in the world. Yeah. 
Bless the Lord. 